As Christians, we turn to God when bad things happen, even though we believe He could have kept them from happening in the first place. Why do we do that? Jerry is going to be talking about that right now. All right, good morning. Uh, quick review where we left off last week. We're in the first century AD in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, some 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the believers are coming under uh, persecution on one side from the Roman Empire, on the other side from the uh, temple religious structure. Um, Herod is going after the leaders of the church, hoping to discourage the others. And when we left off last week, James, who was a leader in the early church, has been taken and has been killed. Um, and now Peter is next and he's arrested. And the followers of Jesus begin to meet and begin to pray for his safety. And right away, we just have to go back to that word crazy. I mean, why didn't God protect James? And after what happened to James, why would the followers of Jesus expect anything better to happen to Peter? And why do we today as believers in and followers of Jesus, why do we turn to God whenever things go bad, even knowing that God could have stopped them from happening in the first place? Well, let's move ahead a few years. Herod does not have Peter killed immediately. He throws him in prison and basically just leaves him there. So now Peter has been in prison several years in Jerusalem. He actually sits down while he's in prison and begins to dictate a letter to Christians who were living in a, a variety of regions scattered around the Roman Empire. Christians who, like himself and who, like his friends in, in Jerusalem, were suffering because of their faith. Now, before I read to you what he writes, I want you to keep in mind that when he is writing this letter, he has been arrested multiple times. He has been physically beaten. He has been living as a fugitive for years. In fact, he kept his whereabouts so concealed that nobody even knows where Peter was between his arrest in Jerusalem and his execution in Rome, uh, maybe like a period of 10 years. And yet in spite of all of this that he's gone through, Here's what he says, and he writes to Christians who are experiencing some of the same things that he is. He begins and he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we read this, and, and as we go through this, I want to have kind of a running conversation with Peter here. So we, we read this and it's like, Hey, Peter, you've been arrested multiple times. Your body is physically scarred from the beatings they've given you. And God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, did nothing to stop it. You have a bounty on your head. Stephen is dead. James is dead. What are you even talking about? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he would say, here's what I'm talking about. And he continues, In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can, never be, uh, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In other words, what Peter would tell all of us is, is, hey, your prayers may not all get answered the way you want them to. And you may never understand the randomness of life, but you have hope. And your hope is not anchored in some theology. You're not at hope, your hope is not anchored in some belief system where you cross your fingers and you really hope that's right. Your hope is not anchored to a book. Peter would say that our hope is anchored to an event, an event that gave him his hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he says this, in all of this, meaning all of these rough times, in all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs in all kinds of trials. He says in light of all that God has done for you through the resurrection of Jesus, you can find joy and you can rejoice even in the middle of suffering and trials. Not joy because of the trials, but joy in spite of the trials because of what God has already done for you. Peter goes on and he says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so again, we would talk back and we'd say, so Peter, 
You're saying we should expect grief and suffering and trials in this life. And Peter would say yes. And he would say, by the way, while that's going on, you need to remember that people are watching. People who are suffering in the same way that you're suffering are watching. And and the people who are suffering without hope, when they watch how you handle it, they may be drawn to your hope and to your faith. And in fact, they may be drawn to the object of your faith. And, and I have said this so many times to, to people as they've gone through things, is we need to remember that our suffering is not always for us, that, that people are watching, and that this is an opportunity to, to shine during this time. Because the darker your suffering is, the brighter your hope shines. And as you try to explain the inexplicable, as you navigate your way through things that you never anticipated ever having to go through, for which there are seemingly no answers, Peter would say, let your light so shine in such a way that people, that when people see your response, they look up. They look up. And then he continues. He says, though you have not seen him, and I love this part because, remember, he's writing to people who had not actually seen Jesus physically in the way that Peter had. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. And so once again, we're going to push back. We say, so Peter, what you're saying is this, that the inconsistency, that the randomness of life, it it does not throw you off. And it does not undermine your faith and your confidence. I mean, come on. I mean, Herod took one of your best friends and, and killed him. And now they, you know, they came for you. And Peter would look at them and he would look at us today. And he would say, listen, my faith doesn't depend on consistency or certainty or in my ability to explain things. My faith is not shaken by the randomness of life. Listen to what he would say. He would say, I saw the best possible person suffer the worst possible death. And it didn't make any sense at all until God raised him from the dead. Let me just kind of bottom line this for you. He would say, so while there's a lot I can't explain and there's a lot I don't understand, he said, I just have to tell you this. After the resurrection, the rest is just detail. The rest is just detail. And then in the same letter, Paul's going to give his audience and he's going to give you and I a really strange to-do list. And that's where we're going to talk about next week. But I want to get back to the story to to get us all caught up. So, So God allows Herod to execute James. And God allows Herod to arrest Peter and to put him in jail. The Jesus followers in Jerusalem are praying, asking God to help get Peter out of jail or to somehow facilitate his release knowing that Herod may be coming for them next. And then for reasons that made absolutely no sense to them at the time, but would be made very clear later, we're going to pick up the story. And it says, and this is a cool story, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shined in the cell. And he... and He struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. So so the angel said to him, Put on your cloak and your sandals. And Peter did so. He said, Wrap your cloak around me and follow me. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. And this is kind of funny. In fact, he thought he was seeing a vision. Peter thought this is all just a dream. But anyway, they they pass through the first and the second guards and they come to the iron gate leading to the city and it opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Now, I think I know what you're thinking because when I read this, I'm probably thinking the same thing. I read all that, you know, suddenly an angel appears and doors open and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And my first thought is, really? (laughs) And then my second thought is, well, why doesn't God do that kind of stuff now? Why doesn't He do that anymore? Why doesn't He do that kind of thing for me? 
I mean, maybe you weren't in prison, but certainly you were in a circumstance and, and it didn't seem like suddenly an angel appeared and said, get up and go, and, and all of a sudden you were free. I mean, we got to be wondering. Uh, you know, that's what we want. Let me tell you what Peter and his friends were probably wondering about now. Why didn't God do that for James? Why didn't an angel of the Lord appear to James the night before he died and said, let's get out? You, you know, you don't have to die. They never got a good answer to that question. And we may never get satisfying answers in this life. But the story goes on, and this is really great. It says, now when Peter realized that this was not a dream, and that he really was safe and outside of the city walls, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John, who is also called Mark, where many people gathered and were praying. So here's this group of believers in Jerusalem meeting at the home of a woman named Mary. Now, this wasn't the Mary that we've been familiar with, and we'll explain who this Mary is ne next week. But, but he goes to this house, and they're all there praying, and they're praying specifically for Peter to be let out of, out of prison. So Peter's out of prison. He knows he doesn't have much time, so he's going to take off to this house where he knows that, that some Jesus followers have been, a place he's been before. And like I said, they're meeting to pray for Peter since he was in prison. And here's where it gets good. So Peter knocked on the outer entrance. So the houses weren't like ours where there's a front door and you knock on it and you're right in the house. Uh, typically, they were built with a courtyard. So this would be the outer door to the courtyard where you would open it and then you'd go in for a while and then you'd step into the house later. So, so Peter knocks on the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, remember, because he had been there before, she was overjoyed, so overjoyed, in fact, that she ran back without even opening the door. And she exclaimed, Peter's at the door. Uh, Peter's at the door. Now, you got to remember, this is a group of serious believers in Jesus Christ. I mean, they're believers in Jerusalem at a time when it was not convenient to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So they're kind of serious and hardcore. And so they're praying for Peter to be released but apparently they didn't expect God to answer the prayer. And, and I thought about all the times in my life when basically I said, yeah, I'll pray about that, but just, you know, not even really thinking it would happen. And you can get it from their response. And, and this is important. I think this is also, their response is also just more evidence of the fact that the writers of the New Testament didn't write the main characters in as heroes. Uh, these weren't people of any more than just average faith. But anyway, they didn't expect to experience miracles every day. And they certainly didn't expect to experience a miracle that night. Now, when Rhoda tells the prayers that Peter's at the door, here's what they said. They said, and I quote, you are out of your mind. <laughs> I mean, so, so they're praying and God answers the prayer and their first thought is, nope, that's not what happened. It's got to be something else. To which we would say, wait a minute, weren't you just praying for this? And they would have said, well, yeah, but we didn't expect anything to happen. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. So they figured she had seen a ghost or something. And, but anyway, so Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. And in my notes, I just wrote, imagine that, an actual answer to prayer. An actual answer to prayer. And they were astonished. At this point, they're so delighted that they start celebrating and they're making so much noise and it's the middle of the night. And remember, they're probably not even supposed to be meeting. So Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And he said, tell James, and this is another James, obviously, from the one who had been killed. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. And then he left for another place. Now, this is so interesting. And this is where it's going to tie in next week because we're going to come back to it. But Luke doesn't write about where Peter went. It just says he went to another place. And remember that when he wrote this, Peter was a wanted man. There were people out looking for him. And Luke knew that if, that if he knew where Peter was, that he shouldn't document it unless his writings fell into the wrong hands. So Peter kind of goes underground. And he did so, so successfully to this day that there's no historian on the secular side, there's no biblical historian who has said, and during this length of time, here's where Peter was. And it's going to be quite a length of time. But anyway, so we say, meanwhile, back at the jail. Okay, remember the jail? Okay, meanwhile, back at the jail, in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. And after Herod had made a thorough search made for him and did not find him, 
he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. So now Herod is publicly humiliated because remember he had killed James and that made every, the politicians and the religious crowd very happy. So, uh, you know, he had promised him they were going to get to see the trial of Peter, the, you know, the number one follower of Jesus. And so now Herod is publicly humiliated. And history says that he's so humiliated that he leaves Jerusalem and he heads off to the west and he goes to an actual beach house, which we would be familiar with here, obviously, that he has on the Mediterranean Sea. In other words, kind of a, a summer palace or something along that line. And, and the, the scripture tells us that while he was there, there was a group from a neighboring city that found out he was there. Perhaps it was too far away from them to, to go when he was in Jerusalem, but now they said, well, he's close, so we're going to go uh, get, get an audience with him. Uh, we want to talk to him. We want him to you know, thank him for all the food and all the stuff the government's you know, kind of been giving him. And, and Luke tells us about this. Luke says that on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. Now, a very famous Jewish historian by the name of Josephus writes about this occasion as well. He said that on this particular occasion that Herod's royal robe was actually made out of, uh, out of silver. And, and when the afternoon sun reflected off of the silver robe that the, cloud, that the crowd just kind of erupted and they declared that, that, that he was a god. Luke writes about it this way. He says, and they shouted when they saw this, this is the voice of a god not a man. Now watch what happens. And immediately, because Herod did not give the praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he died. So he's standing there and, you know, looks like this amazing, you know, figure and all of people just, oh, he, it must be a God, can't be a man. And, you know, Herod's kind of puffing up with pride and all of this kind of thing. And it says that he didn't give the praise to God. So an angel of the Lord came and he died. Again, Josephus in secular history confirms this. It says that Herod, he's a little more uh, blunt. He says that Herod was seized by a severe pain in his bowels, in his gut, and he rushed off stage, and several days later, he died. He died. Now, we, we know that when Herod died, that Peter was not with that group of believers. He was in hiding somewhere. And let me ask you a question. What do you think Peter thought when he got the news that Herod had died? I mean, he was probably relieved, okay? I mean, let's just be honest, he was human. He may have said, good, you know? I mean, that may have been there. But I think that he may have thought, God, if you had just taken him one month earlier, James would still be alive. And I would not have been in prison. So God, why didn't you come through? Why didn't you come through? And then Luke wraps up, his account of this statement in spite of all of this drama, in spite of all of these unanswered questions and all of this stuff that's going on, he wraps it up by saying this, but the word of God continued to spread and to flourish. And in fact, we know that that, that happened, that that's very true. In fact, it's why we have the text that we have today that we can read out of. It's why they were preserved. It's why the name and the message of Jesus would eventually go out from Jerusalem and Antioch and Rome and go all the way around the world. But on a personal level, these events and events like these and the response of our first century brothers and sisters, it's why, to borrow a phrase from the Apostle Paul, it's why, so that you do not grieve as those who have no hope. You do not grieve as those who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus Christ died and he rose again. It's why, to borrow a phrase from Peter, it's why we can cast all our cares on him. Because he cares for you. You can know that God cares for you. In spite of what you see around you, in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the drama, in spite of all that's happening, it's why, again, to borrow a phrase from the writer of Hebrews, he wrote, let us approach God's throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of deed. It is why we have hope, even when we don't have an explanation. And if Peter is correct, and he would know what strikes you and I as random and unfair and unnecessary 
may in fact be random and it may be unfair and it may be unnecessary. But Peter assures us that our hope is not misplaced. Our hope is not in vain. Why? Because God has given us new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we have learned that a living hope, that is, it's a living hope that's not based on our ability to figure it out or explain it, but it's a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have learned that sometimes we ask God for help, but instead He gives us hope. And it's not because it's different, but because it's the same. And we'll pick up from there next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for our time together this morning. We're thankful for this incredible story of, of hope, of a people not quite in our circumstances. All of our circumstances are very different. But people in a, living at a time where, where tragedy just seemed random and where things happened that they didn't understand and they were looking for explanation, but instead God said, let me give you something that you can hope in. Let me give you something that you can hold on to. You can hold on to the fact that the very worst thing that ever happened in history, the crucifixion of my son, led to the best thing that ever happened, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And God, we know that we can hold on to hope because of the promise that you've given us. Father, we're, we need wisdom as a nation, as people, as families. We need wisdom as a church. Uh, God, we pray that you would walk with us this week. We're thankful that you're so patient with us. And we're thankful for Jesus, and we pray this in his name. Amen.